Mark DuPont. Um, as, I just want to camp on that for a little bit. So Mark DuPont, I'm just going to reiterate some of what Pastor Ken said, but he was, he was the senior um, prophetic voice in Toronto in 1994 during the Toronto outpouring and uh, continued there for many, many years. I believe that, that, that move of God went gangbusters for more than 10 years and then continued on in some vein, some fashion for another 10 or so. And it's still a well. It's still like John Arnott and, and the team there are still doing amazing things and, and really digging up the, the, the ground of the region and the ground of people's hearts to, to really behold and lay hold of Jesus. But Mark has also uh, increased to really become a recognized national and international prophetic voice. And, uh, and he's, he's moved in um, circles with the Watchman family. So that's uh, Church of Zion and Papa Gideon Chu and his wife May and also David Damien and his wife Ruth, um, John Lowndes, whom many of you know. And by the way, a couple exciting things. One, uh, Pastor John will be here ministering to us next Sunday. So that's really exciting. And also, uh, on June 21, 22, and 23, we're going to be doing Freedom of the Soul Part 2. Freedom for the Soul Part 2 here at TC. And uh, the last one was just amazing. Many people were really blessed by it. So we're bringing up Mark Sanford again and Pastor John. And we're going to keep going deep into this area of, of the healing of our souls from childhood trauma, from inner wounds, from all of that, all of that stuff that we go through. And God is really beginning to knit the body of Christ together. And he's beginning to move. And he's looking, he's looking for those with ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. One of the key things that the Holy Spirit is saying to the church, I'll go on record and say is, come together. Make more time to come together. Because I believe that we're coming into the time of the Lord's return soon, and the bride has to become the bride at some point, right? <laughs> like Jesus prays in John 17, Father, I pray that they the believers may be one, completely unified, just as you and I are one. How, how one are Jesus and the Father? And Jesus is praying that we will have a level of unity with one another that approximates his connection with the Father. Look at your neighbor and say, we got to become closer friends. We really do. <laughs> We got to get a whole lot closer. Be careful of this, not your wife, okay? Some of you young adults are like, I'm sitting beside the right person. <laughs> but really, we, we, we must come closer together. We must come into a functional, practical, um, vital unity that is so much more than just seeing one another on Sunday. That is, that is really about the first people we reach out to when we want to celebrate something. The first people we reach out to when we want to ask for prayer. <clears throat> I mean, these things, these things can be a real problem to separate us. But you know, if, if you're submitted to Christ and, and you're allowing him to develop in your life the fruit of the spirit of self-control, you can also use these things in amazing ways to stay connected to one another. Uh, we have WhatsApp chats, a whole bunch of them, that, that we use to stay connected um, with the family and also um, with specific groups within the family. There's, there's many different circles that intersect and and, and some of them are sort of a task focus. Hey, we're doing something. And others are, are just a relational focus. Um, well, I should say all of them are a relational focus. And um, I think I want to claim the title of Emoji King because I love to use emojis, especially hearts and praying hands. And then <laughs> praising hands, right? 
And it's amazing when, 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 when you're hurting or when there's a challenge and, and you, know, you hop on that chat and you're like, hey, guys, would really appreciate prayer. And then ding, 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 ding. And you look and there's just like all sorts of people. Or it's like, happy birthday. And then boom, there's like 30, 40 people just jumping on there wishing you happy birthday. I give God thanks for that, not Steve Jobs or whoever invented Android. I mean, they just copied him, but sorry, we won't go there. We'll have a fist fight in here this morning. God wants us walking together. And you say, okay, all right, but what's the goal? Like, what are we going to do? Listen, just walking together for any length of time (laughs) is the goal. (laughs) The hardest thing to do is not get people saved. It's to keep them saved. (laughs) It's to make disciples (coughs) who make disciples. The hardest thing to do is family, long-term, long-term family. Not, you're in my family today, but next week, next month, next year, you offended me. Now, you know, you're my sister in the Lord. I just don't want to see you anymore. (laughs) And then if, you know, I happen to see you in Walmart I'm just using you for, Vicky, this would never happen. It's just an example. But it's like, should I, should I pick on somebody else? Who should I pick on? No, I'm just going to stay with you for a second. Oh, pick on Caleb. Pick on Caleb. So then, because our hearts are one. But it's like, that, guys, that's happening right now. I know, because people are talking to me. I won't go any deeper than that. I'm just saying people in this community are talking to me about the pain they're going through. And there's people been walking together for a long time and then something happens. And now it's like awkward if you see them in Walmart. And this grieves the father's heart. This grieves the father's heart. He doesn't, that, we think that we can have ought against our brother and then come in to worship and think that our worship is going to shift and change the atmosphere, we delude ourselves. God doesn't even want us worshiping him if we've got something against someone. He says, when you come to offer your gift at the altar, we're not killing animals in our day and age. We bring a sacrifice of praise. And he says, if you have aught against your brother, anything, leave your gift at the altar. Go and be reconciled to your brother or your sister, or your mother, or your father, or your son, or your daughter, then come and give your gift. This forgiveness thing, this, this freedom, <coughs> this freedom from offense thing is a really big deal. I find it really interesting, Pastor Ken, that we're over at Pastor Keith's house um, taking out a fence <laughs> to put in a better one, <laughs> to put in a wall. <coughs> I, I, saw, I wish I had it up on the screen, but I saw this, this, this thing on uh, Facebook and it had this picture of, of this yard and there was this line where you could tell the fence posts had been and they'd all been pulled out and there was just the holes. And it said, these posts were removed because somebody took offense. <laughs> <laughs> Our authority in the spirit realm comes down to our unity and our connection and our love with one another. If we're mad, if we're ticked off, if we're prideful, if we're judging one another, man, we kid ourselves if we think that God is listening to our prayers and that the devil is afraid of them. We must forgive. We must forgive everyone. And you say, well, what about the people who've hurt me? Jesus was on a cross. They hadn't finished killing him. (laughs) They're torturing him in the worst possible way. And he's on the cross, more concerned for them than for himself. Father, forgive them. Oh, Lord, they're in so much trouble. I'm going through trouble, but I'm not in trouble. They are in trouble. The people who have wronged you, if they don't know Jesus or if they've fallen away from him, they are in trouble. You're not in trouble if your faith in the Lord is intact. 
I remember a story that Dan Moeller told. Uh, Dan Moeller is uh, Pastor Todd White's uh, pastor down there. Um, Todd White has a school called Lifestyle Christianity University in Dallas, Fort Worth. And uh, it's going gangbusters. I got profoundly impacted down there back in 2019. The Lord baptized me in love and started revealing to me that I had an orphan spirit. And that even though I had good mom and dad growing up, I still compared myself to others and I still competed. And I was still trying to, you know, size people up and figure out, are they better than me? Am I better than them? And it's in there. And you don't even realize it's in there, except when you start playing ping pong and you have to beat them. (laughs) And if they beat you, then you just practice for years until you can beat them. And orphans compete. Orphans compare and then they compete, but sons complete. That's what the guy said when he was down there. But anyway, Dan Moeller, Todd White's pastor, was uh, preaching. <coughs> and he was telling this story about this, this man in, in his church. And the man's wife cheated on him. And they, they had some kids and everything. And the man was distraught and in great pain. And he was weeping and crying and, and, and just wailing at home and so depressed. And Dan Moeller just let it go on for a little bit and he waited. Finally, after three days, the man called him and said, I, Pastor Dan, I need help. He said, yeah, what, what, what seems to be the problem? He said, my wife is with another man. He said, okay, but, but what seems to be the problem? He said, are, are you kidding me? My wife is with another man. He said, yes, yes, that's her problem. But what is your problem? He said, I don't understand. He said, do you still believe in Jesus? The man said, yes. Do you still believe that when you die, he's going to take you to heaven, wipe away every tear from every eye, no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. Do you believe that? Yes. Do you believe he forgives all your sins? Yes then she's in trouble and you're focused on you. This is the woman that you said that you would love in sickness and in health for better or for worse until death do you part. And she has lost her way and she is now in danger of hellfire because she's off fornicating with another man. And you're having a pity party. Get on your knees and pray for your 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 one spirit for your wife, for your covenant partner. Pray for her. I know she's broken covenant, but she might repent and come back to you. And it completely changed the way he was looking at it. That's pretty intense, isn't it? Man, that whacked me so good. Because I went through that situation where somebody very close to me made some choices that I never saw coming. By the way, this is not my wife. <laughs> just just going to say, just put it out there really quick. <laughs> this is somebody else. And I was, I was super, super hurt by those choices. And I started having a pity party. And it was my wife who came and said, what are you doing? You need to be concerned for them. You need to be praying for their reconciliation. You need to be ready to love on them when they come to their senses. That's exactly what happened. And I was like, thank you, Lord. Thank you for your discipline. Just looks a lot like Katerina Bullitt most of the time. (laughs) I just don't know why that is. Why you always got to use her. (laughs) Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Let me finish up as you're turning there with with Mark DuPont. Mark DuPont, whoa, the clock has almost fell on somebody's head. (laughs) Johannes, Alicia just saved your life. (laughs) So, um, Mark DuPont is coming March 22nd and 23rd. And he's coming to the region because he feels God has given him a word for the region. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean, a, a word for the region? Well, he's come because he's got a word for the, for the lower mainland, you know, like for Abbotsford, Mission, Chilliwack and everything. Yes and no. He's, he's come for the people in the region and specific people in the region. People who understand 
that in order to steward what God has prophesied many, many times that he's going to pour out in this region, it will not just be one church that will be able to handle it. Guys, we can fit like maybe 250, 300 max in this church. There's 160,000 people in Abbotsford. There's not enough churches in the whole city if we pack them out twice over for every person who's going to get, if, if, if all of Abbotsford got saved, we couldn't fit them in buildings, not, not in church buildings. We could, fit them, we could fit them in homes. And we could work together. So when he's coming here with a word for the region, what that really means is the believers in the region that God wants to give a word to, speak a seed into, that understand that we're going to walk together, we're going to move together in order to receive together what the Lord is going to pour out because God won't give it to just one person or one church. He's going to give it to the body of Christ in the region who recognize themselves as the body of Christ. See, there's a hundred different churches in Abbotsford, but do we see those other believers in those other churches as just as much our brother and sister as the one sitting beside you? They have no less value. They might have a different function. You know, I heard it said that the only grounds for division within the Bible, biblically, is on geographical lines. To the church in Corinth, to the church in Philippi, to the church in Thessalonica. It's the only grounds for division. But now with this, we are not divided geographically anymore. We can co-labor with people we're praying with Josh and Zoe. They hop on our, on our Zoom call in the morning on Fridays every so often. And we pray with them. So it's really about just lifting up your eyes and seeing who's hearing what the Lord is saying in the same way as what you're hearing. Who's discerning what the Lord is saying. <clears throat> and then you come together with them and you wait on the Lord to deposit his, his rhema revelation in all of our hearts so that we can run with it. So Mark is coming. Mark is coming to um, Julio's church, which is Westwood Community Church in Port Coquitlam. And some time ago, God gave Pastor John Lowndes a word, and he said, I see a threefold cord, and I see Church of Zion, and I see Westwood Community Church, and I see Transform. And I see them as a threefold cord. Not just the leadership, the body coming together with these other churches and saying, let us steward together. Let us press in together for what the Lord wants to do in the region. In the region. Remember, Pastor Ken, that Nino used to say, if you think local, you'll be local. If you think global, you'll be global. We have to start recognizing that God is bringing together the global body of Christ to hear what he is saying in this time. When I was speaking on Maranatha, and I talked about the fact that it says in Revelation Rejoice, O you who dwell in the heavens, for the accuser of the brethren has been cast down. I believe it's the church that is going to cast him down. Now, it's the Holy Spirit in the church, just like if I pray for someone, I didn't heal them. The power of God in me, Christ in me, healed them. But I'm the vessel. And in the same way, as the bride becomes the bride, she will do what is, what is said there in Ephesians, where... Now to the extent that the manifold wisdom of God shall be made known by the church to the principalities and powers. That's, that's the purposes of God. The manifold wisdom, the, the multifaceted, mind-blowing, devil-shaking wisdom of God is when the church comes into unity and worships Jesus and out of that intimacy and out of those moments begins to decree the sovereign word of God into the atmosphere and the principalities are dethroned from their seats. This is, this is our inheritance. This is what we're called to do. And it's not like, wow, we need to, I don't know, we need to go study for years in seminary. I'm not saying that that has no merit. But if you're spending years in seminary and still orphan and competing and comparing and fighting and dividing, no authority. We're not moving anything out of anywhere unless we walk together. And so here comes an opportunity to walk together and Church of Zion and, and Watchmen have been inviting Mark to their gatherings all over the world, in Israel, 
I, I believe in Asia, um, Europe, different places, and in Canada. And so that whole community has an appreciation for who Mark is and his track record. And so there's an excitement in their spirits to receive what God is going to pour out. And Pastor Julio also has walked with Watchmen. And Pastor Julio also knows Mark. In fact, Mark prophesied over Pastor Julio and Papa Gideon years ago. Years ago in Vancouver. They had their heads together and he said, God is calling you to unity and reconciliation. One of you is unity, one of you is reconciliation. And, and then there's us. And we're way out here in the valley. And who's Mark DuPont in Coquitlam? That's a long drive. Let him who has ears to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. God wants to deposit something in us. Can we make ourselves available? Can we pray? Can we really seek? Can we say, Jesus appeared to 500 people, the word says, after he raised from the dead. More than 500 people he appeared to. How come there's only 120 in the upper room? Isn't that interesting? Man, I do not want to be golfing when, <laughs> when the presence of God falls. I want to be there. I want to be there pressing in, waiting. And waiting looks like spending time together. Can you imagine 10 days with 120 people in a room? I mean, I, I believe they had bathrooms. I have to believe they had bathrooms and, and, and a kitchen somewhere. And so they had to wait. A, and, and I don't know if they were just sleeping on the floor. I know they didn't have king size you know, beds with pillow top mattresses back then. But any way you slice it, that's not easy to spend 10 solid days. And they didn't know they were only waiting for 10 days. And so what I really believe the Lord is saying in this season is, church, I want you to begin to come together more. Not, not just here. Just come together with other believers and talk about Jesus. Talk about what he's doing in your life. Talk about the beauty of creation. We did a spontaneous bonfire out at, uh, under the mission bridge there. It was just, hey, who wants to go? I think we had eight or, eight or nine of us, maybe 10 with the kids. <laughs> Adam and Aaron came and brought their kids. And, and I'm going camping with those guys. They rock. They brought a chase lounge and all this stuff. And all the kids all bundled up because it was cold. But it says in the book of Acts that they met together daily, house to house, breaking their bread and eating their meat with gladness and giving heed to the apostles' doctrine and growing in the faith. And the Lord is saying, listen, when I begin to move, when I begin to pour my spirit out and the harvest begins to come in, you're going to have so many babies and Pastor Mike and Pastor Ken are not going to be able to disciple them all. It's going to require every single one of you. It's going to require all of us. In the coming weeks, and guys, it's going to get, it's going to get intense and it's going to get busy. Because, man, we were just meeting here this past week and beginning to look. And we can feel the Holy Spirit just beginning to, to, to it's like the, 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 the steam train. It's going faster. We can feel it going faster. We've got, we've got, um. Pastor John sharing next week, this coming Tuesday, Pastor John's coming to share to our young adults, and then the following Tuesday, he's bringing Joy Lin, who's one of the leaders from the Chinese church there, the Chinese Renewal Churches. It's a whole bunch of, of, of Chinese churches that have come together. They're going to be at this event with Mark DuPont. I don't know how can that building only seats like 400. Um, we're hoping that they're going to live stream, but if they don't, just get there early. <laughs> and she's bringing with her um, I won't say her name, but she's bringing with her a girl whose, whose mom is in another country with a whole lot of people. I'm trying to be careful here. And started a, a, a house church many years ago with a couple dozen people, and that house church is now 10 million. Ten, 10 million people in this church. And so her daughter is coming to share with our young adults. 
We had almost 50 in our young adults there last week. We had friends to friends, girls come down, and I can feel this energy. I can feel this faith. I can feel this expectation beginning to build in God's people going, you know what? Um, Sure, there's fun stuff, and there's all sorts of hobbies, and there's all sorts of other things, but man, I just am getting hungrier and hungrier for Jesus. And getting hungrier and hungrier for Jesus, at some point, looks like falling in love with the rest of him, not just the head of him. Come on. Jesus, I love you. Just don't like your body. You got a beautiful head. I just don't like your body. Because we're the body. Right? And the Bible says he is altogether lovely. Come on, look at your neighbors say, we're all together lovely. We're all together lovely. Like separately, individually, we got some issues. But you put us all together, we're lovely. <laughs> we're lovely. And we're being made lovelier by the day. We're becoming more beautiful because <clears throat> as we behold him and recognize the infinite value in one another, do you know that? Each one of you have infinite value, priceless value. You say, well, how do you figure? Because Jesus shed his blood for you, and what price can you put on the blood of Jesus? It's priceless. Then so are you. Ah, oh, if we could look at one another that way. I think we'd gossip less. I think we'd backbite less. I think we'd run one another down less. I think even our joking one-to-one -one would be fun. You know, I, Pastor Ken and I have a 31-year friendship. Well, my wife and Ken and Char, the, the four of us. <coughs> but Pastor Ken and I, <laughs> no, I can't go there. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll go somewhere. I just can't go there because I'm, we're going to have, we're going to start, we're going to start something heading in the wrong direction. Anyway, we have terms of endearment for one another, and if other people heard them, they would think that we were mad at each other. <laughs> but it's an inside joke because we've gone through so much stuff, and so when Pastor Ken says it, I feel warm and fuzzy. And when he jokes, I never feel thrown under the bus. I feel special because there's this connection, and, and, and it's like his joke is going, hey, like, We've got intimacy. Like, we've gone through stuff. And I'm alluding to that even in the joke. And all of our joking has to be fun for everybody. If I'm having fun at your expense instead of with you, that's not love. That's not Jesus. I think there's going to be lots of joking in heaven. I'm a practical joker. I've done lots. I've kind of quit because the older you get, you know, you, you reap what you sow, right? So... <laughs> I backed way off, so don't come after me, okay? <laughs> but this love thing, this unity thing, and it's the whole enchilada. It's the whole thing. We get so busy. We get so busy trying to, <clears throat> trying to achieve goals. Being, I'm very task-oriented. I'm like, let's get her done. You know, let's just like, figure out a plan, work on it and get it done. But I came to the conclusion recently in this that if the achieving of a ministry objective re requires the sacrifice of a kingdom relationship, the objective is too expensive. If accomplishing something for the kingdom means that we're going to end up at odds with one another and not talking to one another or backbiting against one another or gossiping or just angry, it was too expensive. Whatever we tried to do, and, 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 and we've been there and done this. I mean, <clears throat> the charismatic stream has got a lot of fired up preachers and, and, and prophets and evangelists and busyness. And then Jesus says really scary stuff like, many will say, <laughs> Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out devils in your name, and in your name do many mighty miracles. And he will say to them, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, I never knew you. I love what Eli Miller, the one that Pastor Ken was referring to, who's going to do the marriage seminar, he said, what that means there in the original language is you were not in an approved relationship when you did those things and they were not authorized by me. You were doing them for you. You were castle building, not kingdom building. 
when I was down in LCU and that prophet came out, he said, 1 Corinthians 14 says this, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. In other words, pursue love. That's the thing we should chase and desire gifts, the spiritual gifts to make you a better lover so that you can more effectively love people. Because prophecy is a powerful gift of God and it builds people up. And if you're pursuing love, your number one goal is to build people up and look at this powerful tool I can use because what I really want to do is build people up. And he said, but so much of the church has it backward. Instead of pursuing loves and desiring gifts, we pursue gifts because we desire to be loved. We're going to function in the gifts and then everybody's going to be impressed with us and then we'll feel loved and significant. He said an orphan will be in a room and prophetic words will be given and an orphan will grab hold of one that's given to him and he'll run out of the room clutching it like he stole it because he thinks this thing's going to give him identity. When I'm a preacher, when I'm traveling the nations, when I'm doing this, when I make a whole bunch of money, then I'll be somebody instead of understanding that the prophetic words that God gives each one of us is not for us, it's for the body. It's for the building up of the body. And we're grateful that he's given us something so that we can love people and show them the love of Christ and bring joy to our Father's heart. This is what he wants us to do. And so he said this. He said, what if false prophecy has far more to do with intent than content? I was like, deep. In other words... Even if I'm getting the words right, even if I'm accurately discerning something, if the motive of my heart wasn't genuinely loving you, but was to try and puff myself up, somehow it gets taken in the spiritual realm and twisted, and it doesn't produce life. It can produce death. So when Jesus says, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, who's he talking to? What church? We talked about this before. Come on. The charismatic church, right? He's not talking to the people who don't believe in prophecy, laying on of hands, casting out devils, or doing miracles. (laughs) And so he says, many will say, Lord, Lord. We found out the hard way. And by God's grace, we've also found out the right way, that love is best. Doing everything from a basis of love is best. I want you to... uh, Yeah, Hebrews 12, I told you to turn there. So therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. I just keep reminding myself, I'm never alone. I'm never alone. Even even when nobody is around me, I'm never alone. And I confess things because I'm aware that the Father's listening, the Holy Spirit is in me, Jesus is listening, my angels are listening, all of heaven, the spiritual realm is listening, the demons are listening, the great cloud of witnesses is watching. And I want to go on record. No, come on, guys, there's some hidden manna. There's some real keys here for you. Listen, when you are struggling, when there's something going sideways in your life, go on record. Confess. Because God is not a man that he should lie. God is holy and just. It's not like if you confess faith in God, and I do this a lot when I'm alone. I confess faith in God. I confess, I humble myself before God. I repent before God because I'm not alone. I'm being watched by the whole spiritual realm. And when I do that, they all see and they're like, God, look, 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 he's confessing you. He's repenting. Not like God would be like, okay, fine. I have to forgive him. No, of course. Of course he forgives us, but the spiritual realm shifts and changes based on what you say. It totally is not an insignificant thing. It says, it says, if you believe in your mouth, sorry, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. And we think that's when you pray the prayer. That's throughout your life. That's your whole life. Confess with your mouth. 
man, I'm going through a rough day. No, I'm not. This is the day the Lord has made. And he has not ordained calamity for me. He has not said, Mike, I have withheld grace from you for today. Every other day of your life, I'm going to give you grace to manifest the kingdom, which is righteousness, peace, and joy. But this day, I'm withholding it from you, and there's nothing you can do. You're just going to have a bad day. God will never, ever do that. He's always giving you grace to manifest the kingdom. doesn't matter what people are doing to you, what the economy is doing to you, what your prime minister is doing to you. God will always give you grace to manifest the kingdom, which is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And faith, hope, and love. These three remain. Faith, hope, and love. It's not these three remain. Faith, hope, and love, and occasionally some belly aching if things are really, really bad. That's the bad translation. Don't go with that. No, there's always grace from God to manifest the kingdom. I had more to do, but we're going to skip down to a really important verse here. Verse 12. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Pursue peace with all people. Who's left out? Nobody. You pursuing peace with Trudeau? Good job, Greg. Pursuing peace with a person doesn't mean I have to agree with what they think, what they're doing, what they believe. doesn't mean I have to agree with that at all. It means I have an understanding that my feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I am prepared in every situation to forgive, to love, to bless. Jesus said, bless those that curse you. Pray for those that despitefully use you. Be kind. God sends his reign on the just and the unjust. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And this pursuing peace with all people, it needs to start, you know, obviously between you and your wife and your kids and, and your family, your immediate family, your extended family, and definitely your church family. But God is wanting a people of peace that he will use to take the gospel of peace, the true gospel of peace, into the whole world. And those people are prepared to love, are prepared to forgive, are prepared to walk in peace toward all people. It says, as much as it lies with you, be at peace with all people. Now, some people just want to fight with you. And I'm, I'm not a... I'm not a pure pacifist. I kind of call myself an active pacifist, which is to say, I'll fight if necessary to keep the peace. <laughs> to protect people is what I mean. Like if people are going to come in and hurt somebody, then I will do my best. I'm not trying to kill anybody, but I'll do my best to try and prevent people from hurting others. And maybe myself at some point. But it's about the heart attitude going, God, I want the love of Christ to flow through me and reach everyone around me. So yes, it starts with forgiveness. Like that's just the first thing. But then it begins to move into, how do I respond when I see nonsense going on in our nation? When I see, you know, men taking over women's sports, do I become angry toward those people? And if something happens to them, do I celebrate? The Bible says, do not celebrate the downfall of the wicked. Do not celebrate. Don't rejoice when your enemy stumbles. Why? Because they're in trouble and we're not in trouble. We might be going through some trouble at some point in your life. You will go through trouble. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. We're going to walk together. 
And as the enemy comes against us and he begins to prod and poke and, and try and instigate and try and get a fleshly response out of us, we're going to encourage one another and go, it's not worth it. Forgive them, bless them, release them. God actually says, leave place for wrath. Leave room for the wrath of God. Do you know that if you bless rather than cursing those who are doing wrong against you, then God will step in on your behalf. But if you're going to take up your own wounded kind of, I can't believe God's like, okay, well, I'll, I'll kind of let you go for it then. Listen, what, what he can do to them is way worse than what you can do to them. Now, our hearts should not be, yeah, I'm going to bless them so God will get them. <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's not what we're talking about, okay? <laughs> there has to be a sincere desire in there that they would come to faith or that it would be granted repentance, right? Yes, and then they'll come to repentance. <laughs> but the times that we're living in are not ones that we should waste. It's not time for half measures. It's not time to just, just be busy doing worldly stuff. I don't mean sinful stuff. I just mean stuff that isn't advancing the kingdom. <coughs> and one of the best things that you can do is get together with other believers and just fellowship. Pastor Caleb at Church of Zion has a saying, more eating, less meeting. That's a serious motto. And it's biblical because it says, and they met together daily, house to house, breaking their bread and eating their meat with gladness. Food is amazing to bring us together and to fellowship, to share a meal together. When Pastor David, Papa David went with, or Pastor Ken went with Papa David and 300 leaders over to Armenia, they had many times of fellowship and eating together. And in that, their hearts were knit together. Oh, Father, help us not to, help us not be too busy to meet with Jesus. Because you're all part of Jesus, right? Come on, are you part of the body of Christ? So are you a precious part of Jesus? And your neighbor's a precious part of Jesus. Let's meet together. Let's eat together. Let's love on one another. Let's open up about what we're going through. Let's pray for one another. Let's find ways to connect. Because Jesus said, I pray that they may be one just as you and I are one. <coughs> Jesus was continually seeing what the Father was doing, continually hearing what the Father was saying. We must walk together. And this is really what the gathering's about. This is what Watchman has been doing for the better part of 20 years, actually over 20 years, is they get together in these gatherings, and it's, when they first started doing them, nobody had any idea what they were. Because the Lord spoke to David, and he said, you do lots of conferences, lots of seminars, lots of uh, you know, teaching focuses, and we're going to do a conference on this and a conference on that. And he says, I want you to do a conference, but I don't want you to have any topic. And I don't want you to invite any special speakers and tell people who's going to speak in what sessions or anything. And David was like, okay. And he went and he told everybody else there. And they're like, that's different. <laughs> and so they advertised it. And amazing, so many people came because the Lord says, I want to be Lord of my church. You just gather together, love one another, worship me together, and I'll come and fill the room and fill the people in the room, and I'll bring a piece of the puzzle from this one, and another piece from this one, and another piece from that one, and another piece from over here, and I'll bring it together, and I'll reveal great and mighty things which you have not known. I'll reveal the bigger picture of what I'm doing in the earth. And you can stop running around with your own ax to grind, your own chip on the shoulder about this or that, and it's not changing things. Guys, honestly, look, there's a lot of stuff that's... There's a lot of entities that are organized against us from corporate media with hundreds of billions of dollars. Or the, sorry, media and, and then corporations and then government. <clears throat> there's, there's these massive people with an agenda and it's not what God wants. And we're gonna stand up and try and fight against them with you know, our, 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 our middle class income. No, that, no, we're gonna fight against them, but not that way. We're going to come together and actually love one another. That's why the enemy's always trying to sow division amongst us because he's terrified that we could actually walk in unity. 
We come together and we love one another and then we worship the Lord and we just wait on him. And then he says, hey, I think we need to deal over here. There's some, there's some deep pain and we need some reconciliation between these people or between these groups here. And we go, oh, okay. And then we go into it with our full heart and we repent, we humble ourselves. A lot of time, identificational repentance. And then we see God just knit something together. And he says, okay, now, what's hindering the authority of the church is also this thing here that happened back then, and I wanna deal with that. And I wanna, because there's blood cr crying from the ground, and we need someone to repent for that so that it can be put under the blood. And it's amazing. They've had over 150 documented cases of them doing gatherings, and then within days of them doing the gatherings, some wicked leader would be exposed. Some government would fall and, 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 a, and, and a better one would be put in. So, somebody would die, like crazy stuff. Over 150 cases of this happening. This is how the church is called to govern. Psalm 149, with the high praises of God in their mouths and a two-edged sword in their hands to execute judgments upon the nations and vengeance upon the peoples to bind their kings with uh, and, and uh, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron this honor have all his saints say all, all. say I'm a, I'm a saint say that means me, that means me. hallelujah come on 